Hello and welcome to the session in which we're going to be working within chapter 10 and we're up to um, networking capital and de depreciation. In the previous session we looked at networking capital and details. In this session we'd look at depreciation. So let's go ahead and start to work with depreciation. The first thing we learn about depreciation, depreciation is what? Is a non-cash deduction. As a result depreciation has a cash flow consequences only because it influences the tax bill. What does that mean? When we have depreciation, depreciation is an expense. And what do expenses do? Expenses reduces your taxable income. And what does your taxable income does? If you reduce your taxable income, you could reduce your taxes. So starting with depreciation, so depreciation reduces your taxable income reduces your taxes although although depreciation itself is a not non cash so you have something that's non cash reducing your taxable income so in a way it's benefiting your cash flow because it's reducing your taxes without actually without you actually paying for it okay actually you paid for it when you bought the asset but you paid for it in the past the way the depreciation is computed is relevant for capital investment decision. Why? Because remember, it's, if it affects our cash flow, it's considered relevant. And depreciation does affect our cash flow. So not surprisingly, the procedures are governed by the tax law. Now we're going to look more at the tax law, which is kind of an accounting concept, specifically tax accounting, not, not accounting, it's even IRS accounting. We now discuss some specifics of the depreciation system enacted by the Tax Reform Act of 1986. The system is a modification of what's called ACRES Accelerated Cost Recovery System instituted in 1981. So the first thing we're going to look at is the system called the MAKERS. And MAKERS stand for Modified Accelerated Depreciation MAKERS. And you cover this topic much, much more in details in your, uh, in your tax course. But I'm going to give you a feeling of it because you need to know how it works for our purposes, which is cash flow purposes. Calculating depreciation is normally mechanical. It's very, the formula is very simple, okay? Although there are numbers of ifs, ands, and buts involved, the basic idea under makers is that every asset is assigned a particular, particular class life. So basically, every asset, according to the IRS, falls into a class. What is those, those classes? Those classes are three, five, seven, ten years. So this is a three-year class, five-year class, seven-year, ten-year ten class. So every asset falls under one year. An asset class establishes its life for tax purposes, either three years, five years, seven, or ten. Or there's more, but I'm just giving you an example. Once a tax life is determined, the depreciation for each year is computed. Very easy. Notice, multiplying the cost. Oops, I don't want to erase this. Uh, multiplying the cost by the, by the uh, of the asset by a fixed percentage. So basically take the cost multiplied by a percentage that's given in the table. You need to know that for tax purposes, the expected salvage value is worth zero. So there's no salvage value. So you don't have to take into account the salvage value because for tax purposes, the IRS said, ignore the salvage value, there's no salvage value. Okay, so the calculation ignores any salvage value. And the expected life, are not explicitly considered in the calculation. So the expected economic life, what, what the economic life, how long it's going to last us, it doesn't matter. The IRS tells us it's going to last us three, five, or seven years, and we'll do the depreciation based on that. It doesn't matter. This asset, the IRS might say it's going to last you three years, and it's going to last you five, or it's going to last you two years. That That's irrelevant for tax purposes. So for tax purposes, it's very mechanical. We'll take the cost multiplied by a certain percentage according to the class life. So let me show you a class life. For example, three-year asset are equipment used in research. So any equipment used in research, you will depreciate it using three years. Automobiles, computers. If you bought an automobile or if you bought a computer, you will depreciate it over five years. Most industrial equipment, such as furniture. Furniture is one of those seven-year assets. And there's a whole list, so a long list of each class life. So when you buy a computer for tax purposes, you don't choose the life. The IRS tells you it's it's a, the class life is five years, therefore you have to use five years. So here are three property classes, the three-year, the five-year, and the seven years. And here's what happened. If you bought a computer, the first thing you determine is, what is the class life of my computer? And it says here, computer has a five-year class life. So you have to use, 
when you're depreciating the computer you would use this table here so you will take if you bought it for a thousand dollars so you'll take 1000 times 20 percent for year one 1000 times 32 percent in year two 1000 times 19.2 percent year three 1000 times 11.52 year four so on and so forth and if you fully depreciate the asset, if you add all these percentages, they will add up to 100%. So you would fully depreciate the computer over the life of the asset. Now, there's a few things that we don't mention here, the mid-year convention, the mid-quarter convention. We don't use in here, but there's more, more calculation involved, but we don't use it for our purposes. All what you need to know is if you bought an asset, what's the depreciation, and if the deep and how does the depreciation help into the cash flow formula, which we'll see shortly. Okay, but this is how we calculate depreciation. Now, there's also what we called non-residential real property because the IRS differentiate between real property or personal property and non-residential and residential so for the irs there's another class called non-residential real property such as office building is depreciated over 31.5 years using the straight line so if you bought a non-residential non-residential is what non-residential means a business okay because residential means rental your who do you rent to residential means residential means people people live in residential properties like a building where you rent it to tenants but non-residential is business if you have a business property you would depreciate it over 31.5 years using straight line. If it's a residential property, such as apartment building, you would use 27.5. So if you bought a building where you, you're using it to rent it for, for people, let's assume you, you paid a million dollars, you divide it by 27.5, okay? If, if it's a million dollar and it's an office building, it's a non-residential, you will divide it by 31.5. Now, this is a simplification of the calculation because year one is a little bit different depending which month you bought it, but this is the basic idea of straight line. But again, this is not the exact answer because we don't have to do the exact answer here. They use a different schedule. It's called a mid-month convention, which is we don't have to worry about this. But the idea is you will take the cost and you'll divide it separately over 27 and 27.5 for residential, 31.5 for non-residential, if it's a building, which is a real property. And what is a real property? How do they find real property? Not movable. So when the IRS says this is a real property, real property means the property cannot be moved. And what does it mean cannot be moved? It means you cannot move it. This property cannot be moved. For example, furniture is a movable, movable property, but real estate or a warehouse or a piece of land, those are not movable, which which are called real property, real property. So to illustrate how depreciation is calculated, we consider an automobile costing $12,000. So we're gonna work an example to show you how depreciation is mechanically calculated. Then what we do is show you the effect on the cash flow. So Automobile are normally classified as five-year property. And what does it mean, five-year property? It means you have to go to the five-year property class right here. This is the five-year property. Looking at the table, we see that the relevant figure for the first five-year asset is 20%. So the first year, notice it's 20%. This is the table. So what you do is to calculate depreciation, you take $12,000 times 20%, and your depreciation expense is $2,400 for year two. For year one, I'm sorry, for year two, the rate is 32%. You'll take 12,000 times 32%, and this is your depreciation expense. For year three, 19.2. For year four, 11.52, so on and so forth. Notice, by year six, you depreciated this asset 12,000. Now, you might be saying, if it's a five-year property, why did we go into the sixth year? The reason is, I'm going to tell you, but you don't have to worry about this, is because the first year, you are using what's called a mid-year convention. We are assuming here that we are using something called mid-year convention. Again, you don't have to worry about this, just in case you're wondering why did we depreciate it over six years? Because year one, you're only taking half a year depreciation. That's why, okay? So this is the depreciation every, every year for this vehicle. So in total, 12,000. So notice that maker's percentage sums up to 100,000. It means we have no salvage value, the whole asset is depreciated. 100% of the asset gets depreciated. Now, in calculating depreciation under current tax law, the economic life and the future market value of the asset are not an issue. 
As a result, the book value of an asset can differ substantially from the market. Of course, the book value of an asset is different than is different than than its uh, uh, the book value is different than the market value. Why? Because the market value is uh, the market value is determined by buyers and sellers, and the book value is determined by your depreciation. For example, our twelve thousand dollar car book value after the first year is nine thousand six hundred. So notice the book value. So what's the book value? The book value is the cost, the beginning book value minus any depreciation. So the book value at the end of the year is 9,600. Year two, you will take the beginning book value minus the depreciation equal to the book value in year two, 5,760. So notice the, the, the book value will be different than the market value. Because if you want to sell this car, if you tell them my book value as 9,600, they're going to say, we don't care what your book value is. We're going to pay you whatever we think it's worth. And as long as you agreed, that will be the market value. They might pay you 10,000 for it, or they might pay you 2,000 for it. You know, it, so the book value and the market value are obviously not related to each other. Okay. So let's keep going. Let me just calculate capture the uh, schedule because I'm going to need to do some calculation here. So let's assume now we're going to sell the car. Okay. Suppose, suppose now we wanted to sell the car after five years and after five years, what happened to the, what happened to the, uh, to the depreciation? Um, it should go down after we fully depreciate it, it should go down to zero. It would be worth say 25% of the purchase price. Let's assume we were able to sell it for 3000. So we're able to, so the market value, the true market value is 3000. How did we know this? Because we can sell it for 3000. Okay. If we actually sold it for this, then we would have to pay taxes, uh, or, uh, taxes on the ordinary income tax rate on the difference between the selling price and the book value. Sorry, the book five years is 691. So the book value for the car is in year five. Once the year five has ended, here's year five, the book value is 691. So what we do is we'll take $3,000. This is the what we sold it for minus the book value 691.20. And we're going to get we're going to make a profit. Think about it $2,308.80. This is the profit on the car. So to calculate the profit on the car to calculate the tax profit specifically, you will take how much you sold it for minus the book value. So the market, basically, we're not going to call it the market since you sold it. It's already sold. This is the selling price. You sold it for 3000 minus the book value. This is going to tell you if you have a profit or a loss, which is here you have a profit. Now what's going to happen because you had a profit, what do you have to do? The IRS will say, now you made a profit, you're going to have to pay us taxes. And let's assume you're in the 34% tax bracket. You have to pay taxes $784.99. So what does that mean? It means although you sold the car for $2,308.80, you have to pay the IRS $784.99. You have to pay taxes on this profit. Therefore, your cash flow, your cash flow is less than 2,308. Why? Because you had to pay taxes. So to be specific, let's find out what's your true cash flow. 2,308. Oops, that's your, sorry, that's your, uh, sorry, made a mistake here. You have to pay taxes of $784.99. So what's your cash flow? You sold it for 3,000, but you have to subtract your taxes 784.99 so your actual cash flow from selling this asset 3000 minus 784.99 is $2215 and one penny so this is your cash inflow not 3000 although you sold it for 3000 but but you have to pay taxes you have to pay taxes on on the profit and by paying taxes on the profit what's going to happen is your cash flow will go down your cash flow will go down okay 
So the reason taxes must be paid is that the difference between the market value and the book value is excess depreciation. It must be recaptured when the asset is sold. What this means is that it turns out we over depreciated the asset by 2,308 because the depreciation was faster. Because we deducted 2,308 too much in depreciation, we paid 784 too little in taxes. We simply have to make up the difference. Simply put, don't worry about the term recapture. All what we're saying here, you sold the asset for $2,308 more than its book value. Because the book value is $691, you sold it for $3,000. You sold it more than its book value by $2,308. I don't like to use the... I don't like you to think about the word recapture because this means something else for tax purposes. So that's why they put it in quote. It's incorrectly used to tell you the truth in this context. So basically, you had a gain. And what do you do when you have a gain? You pay taxes on the gain. And when you pay taxes on the gain, your cash flow goes down. Okay? Notice this is not a capital gain. Okay? This is not a capital gain because in taxes, there's a capital gain and there's ordinary gain. As a result, a capital gain occurred if the market price exceeds the original cost. However, what is this is what the total, what is not capital gain is ultimately end up being. And uh, however, what is, what is, and what is not a capital gain is ultimately up to the taxing authority and this, and the specific rules can be complex. We will ignore capital gain taxes for the most part. So we don't, we don't care if it's capital or ordinary. Indeed, you should not worry about it unless you are taking your tax course, which is not a tax course. Now, finally, if the book value exceeds the market value, so let's now work a different example where, where the book value exceeds the market value, then the difference is treated as a loss. For example, if we sell the car after two years for 4000 so let's see what happened here. So now we're going to change the scenario. After two years, this is two years, so the book value was 5760 We sold the car for 4000 So let's see what happened here. So we sold the car for 4000 The book value is 5760 We are at a loss of 1760 This is a loss. Okay, now, how is the loss affect our taxes? Well, it's going to be the opposite. Now, because we have a loss and our tax rate is 34%, we're going to take the loss. 1760 times 0.34, that's $598.40. What is this? This is tax savings. What does that mean? This is a cash inflow. This is a cash inflow. What happened is, because we incurred the loss, the losses reduce our taxes, and if we reduce our taxes, we have a tax saving that's an inflow of cash. In this case, we have an inflow of cash or tax savings by $598.40. So if you have a gain, your cash flow will be less because you have to pay taxes on the gain, just like we had a gain earlier, and we had to pay $784.99. Here we had the loss. If you have a loss, loss will save you on your taxes. And let's work an example to see how this work. The staple company just purchased a new computerized information system with a cost of 160. The computer is treated as a five-year property. What are the yearly depreciation allowance? Based on historical experience, we think that the system will be worth $10,000 when staple gets rid of it in four years. What are the tax consequences of the sale? What are the total after-tax effect of the sale? Okay, so the first thing is you wanna know your depreciation. Well, it's a five-year property. So what you do is you will take, you will use the five-year depreciation schedule and you will take 160 times 20%, 160 times 32, 160 times 19.2, 160 times 11.52. So this is your depreciation every year, okay, total of 160. Then this is your book value every year. So you will take your cost minus any prior depreciation. So notice your book value goes down over the years, goes down to zero once the asset is fully depreciated. So this is the depreciation numbers. So, what they're asking us to do here, based on historical data, we think in four years, it's $10,000. So, in four years, the book value is 27648 And how much are we going to sell it for? We're going to sell it for 10000 
Okay, notice that we have also computed book value. Okay, so the book value is this much. We're going to sell it for this much. So obviously we are at a loss because we're going to sell it. We're going to sell it for 10,000 and the book value minus 27,648. We are at a loss of 17,648. 17,648. So this is a loss. Now what's going to happen? The loss is what? The loss, it's going to give us a tax saving. So assuming we're in the 34% tax bracket, we're going to take the loss, 17,648 times the tax rate, 34%. We're going to give us $6,000 in savings, tax savings. So, so $16,000 in tax saving. What does that mean? If we sold it, if we sold it, okay, so the total after tax cash flow, if we sold it for 10,000, then the tax savings were 6,000. So the total cash inflow is 16,000. So technically, because we sold this asset at a loss, we saved 6,000 in taxes. This is the savings. How, how did I get the savings? I took my loss times my tax rate, gave me my savings. The gain will be the gain times the tax rate, the additional taxes I have to pay. With losses, it's savings. Therefore, if I receive 10,000, this is the actual receive, plus my $6,000 in savings, so my cash inflow is $16,000. I receive $10,000 immediately in cash from the buyer, and the IRS is going to give me $10,000 reduction in my taxes, so because I sold this asset, my cash inflow is $16,000. Simply put, if you have a gain, first let, let's summarize everything that we did. So what you do is you take your selling price, minus the book value. How do you come up with the book value? The book value is the cost minus accumulated depreciation. So you have to use the depreciation schedule to find out what's your book value. Cost minus accumulated depreciation gives you your book value. If your selling price is 100 and your book value is 80, you have a gain of 20. Because you have a gain of 20, you have to take the gain. Let's assume your tax rate is 10% for simplicity, your tax rate is 10%. So $20 in gains times 10%, you have to pay $10 in taxes. So if you sold the asset for 100, you only received, you have to pay $4 in taxes, your cash inflow is 96. Now let's assume you sold it for 80 and the book value is 100. So now you have a loss of 20. What's going to happen with the loss? This is a loss of 120. The loss is $20, assuming again, times 10% tax rate, you have a $4 in tax savings. So what is your cash inflow? You sold it for 80, then you're going to get $4 in savings. You're going to get $84 is your cash inflow. And here you have to subtract $4. This is your cash inflow, cash inflow so basically if you have a loss it's going to save you with it's, it's going to save you some taxes this is going to be a plus if you have a gain you have to pay taxes this is basically what we are saying and you need to know how to come up with the book value and you, you need to know how to come up with the depreciation which is based on the irs schedule if you have any questions any comments by all means email me or email me